There's no better way to get more out of your computer hardware than through containerization. And what better containerization method than Docker? Now, a lot of you run Windows, and unfortunately, Docker isn't really natively supported in Windows, but don't worry, there's a way around that using Docker Desktop. So here we are in Windows 10, and let me mention that you do not need Docker Desktop. You can get by with just the engine and CLI, but there are some cool features within Docker Desktop that I want to show off. Now there are versions for Mac, Windows, and even Linux. Obviously we are on Windows, so let's check out the documentation. And throughout this process, you'll notice that the documentation is really good, so you can go through at your own pace, but we're gonna go ahead and walk through step by step. So unless you're using Hyper-V, we are going to need the WSL2 backend, which is Windows subsystem for Linux, which essentially will run a version of Linux directly within Windows. Now there are a lot of different distros you can pick, but the default one will be Ubuntu, and that's what we're gonna go with because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. So before we install that, let's check out the requirements here. So one of them being 64-bit processor, which is pretty much anything in the last 15, 20 years, four gigabytes of system RAM, and this is the important one, BIOS level hardware virtualization support. So this needs to be turned on within the BIOS. So depending on if you have an Intel or an AMD processor, you wanna make sure you go into the BIOS and enable virtualization. And depending on which version of Windows you're running, you may need to run this Linux kernel update package to make sure that the WSL2 installation works. So let's check it out. We're going to click on the documentation and look at that. It's fairly simple, one line to get it installed. So you're gonna go ahead and open up PowerShell and run the WSL install command. Now I've already installed it, so it's just giving me a list of all the help stuff. But what I can do is run WSL list online and it'll give me a list of all the different distros I can install using WSL. Now, I just did the default, which is Ubuntu, and if I simply run WSL, bada bing, bada boom, we have a Linux machine. And we can treat it as a regular Linux machine. I mean, it'll work just like if you installed Linux on your desktop or in a virtual machine. So yeah, cool, nobody asked. We care about Docker, so let's get back to that. So now that we have WSL2 installed, now we can install Docker Desktop for Windows. So we'll just click this Docker Desktop for Windows, it will install, or it will download rather, and now we can install it. All right, so obviously we're using WSL2 instead of Hyper-V, and sure, let's add a shortcut. All right, installation succeeded, that's good, close. And now we can open up Docker Desktop for the first time. I accept, take all of my info. What's your role? Um, where's, where's the tech YouTuber option? All right, so here we are, Docker Desktop. It's beautiful, right? I know. And like I mentioned, we have access to the CLI, so we can just type Docker in PowerShell and boom. Now I'm not gonna go over everything with Docker, that's way outside the scope of this video, but let's walk through Docker Desktop. So they do give you a little command to run to get started because obviously there are no containers there are no images, there are no volumes, there's nothing. So we're gonna go ahead and copy that, paste it into PowerShell, run it, and obviously the image is not there. It's going to pull it and then run our container. So just like that, it was updated. It gives us a little bit of information about each container that's running, the name, what image it's from, status, and the ports. So we can actually click on that. It will bring us to the hosted web page that it is running, and there it is. That is the getting started container that we just run. See, it's hosted within localhost, which is this actual machine. So cool, we are hosting something on Docker within Windows, neat. And from here, it's running. You can basically break free from the nest and fly off into the sunset if you'd like, but I'm gonna walk through some of the things that I like about it and how I actually use it on my main machine. Now I'm a big fan of Docker Compose and the Docker desktop installation actually installs Docker Compose for us. So 
Let's walk through an installation using Docker Compose. I'm gonna do a uh, file browser installation. So if you don't know what file browser is, it's an app that essentially is like a slimmed down version of Nextcloud. So, so if we go in my documents, you'll see that I have a Docker folder that I created. If we go in there, you'll see that there's a file browser folder that I created. And you'll see that there's a config, a data, and then a compose.yaml file. Now I created all of these, but the important thing is this compose.yaml. This is going to be an instruction set that tells us basically what to do when Docker runs it. So let's open it up and check it out. So taking a look at it, it doesn't look too much different than if you were to see a normal, just regular Docker command. It has the image, the user ID, ports, volumes, basically everything that you'd need out of a regular command. But the good thing about Compose is that it actually lets us combine multiple containers, networks, and whatever into a single stack. Now, this is just a very simple one, but Again, I just like the layout of Compose. I like having Compose files, makes it a lot easier. You may think differently and that's okay. So here you'll notice a couple of things. I'm using port 6443 to pass through to the internal 8080 port. And then for the volumes, it wants volumes for a data and a config directory. And you can see that I've passed these exact file directory locations to these directories. And to run this, it's actually pretty easy. So within PowerShell, we're going to CD to that directory, which was in my documents, Docker, file browser. And if I list what's in here, you can see there's my compose file. And all we have to do is run Docker, compose, up, D. And that's gonna look for a compose.yaml file, pull it and do everything it needs to do. And you can see right away, it created our stack. You see it looks slightly different from just a regular container. And if we go down in there, you can see there's just a single container running in there. So let's check it out. If we click on the port, it'll open up. Boom, just like that, we have file browser. And log in using admin admin. Maybe we create a new folder, test. Then we create a new file in that folder. Leave me alone. Call this one test file and say hello, save, neat. So if we go into that location that we pass through data, you can see, oh, look at that, a test. And within test, there's our test file. Hello. So here we have file browser container running within Docker desktop using Docker Compose and pass through a host binding mount on our Windows machine. So you may have noticed uh, within that Docker folder, I had one for Pi-hole as well. And just like that, I have another compose file in there, but let's take a look at how we basically use a compose file and how we get a template of sorts. So if I wanted to install Pi-hole, I would say Pi-hole Docker compose. Going to Docker Hub, we can see the Pi-hole page and scrolling down just like that, they give us a template to use for Docker Compose. And you'll notice this for a lot of things you wanna run in Docker. So you notice there's a bunch of ports it needs to pass through. You can specify a time zone. And then again, the volumes, these are default paths to use within Linux. So we essentially don't even need to touch much of this. So if I open up mine, we'll see, it's honestly probably pretty similar. Yeah, almost copy and pasted. I'm using a different port for the web UI, but again, it's it's pretty much the same thing. So just like the other one, we can go in to that location. We're going to go to Pi Hole, and we are going to run the same command, docker compose up D. It's gonna do the exact same thing. There it is being created. It is done being created. And just like file browser, a single container within our stack. So we hosted it on port 8082. So if we go to that, it's gonna be like, oh, forbidden, blah, blah, blah. Just go to the slash admin page and log in with the default Pi-hole password. And look at that, you have Pi-hole ready to set up for DNS for your entire network. Now, if you've watched my videos, you know that I'm a portainer boy and portainer is just a Docker orchestrator that gives you a more usable GUI and adds a couple of more features to your already existing Docker instance. So we're gonna go ahead and install Portainer. 
Now we're gonna be using the community edition because we're not a businessman. Set up new using Docker standalone. And it's gonna ask you if you're running on Linux or WSL. Honestly, I think both of these instructions are pretty much identical. It's two lines, honestly, so pretty easy either way. The first one is going to be to create a Docker volume called portainer data. Now we could just take this, copy it and paste it within PowerShell, but let's go into Docker desktop, go to volumes and we can just create it here. The power of a GUI. So say portainer, is it hyphen data? Just like that, it's created. And if you're thinking, cool, a volume, but where the hell is it? So to access your Docker data, you can do that within File Explorer. Just open it up. And we are going to navigate to backslash backslash wsl.localhost. And in here, you will see some different locations. The one we want is Docker desktop data. And within there, go to data, Docker, volumes, and look at that, there's our portainer volume. And if you want some other information in there, it can be all found within this directory. And I'm just noticing it is underscore data, not hyphen. So um, yeah, let's fix that. Delete, delete forever, create portainer underscore data. Neat. And now we can run the one single line Docker command to install portainer. Just copy it from there, paste, run. And let's watch it. I always like watching it on the container screen in real time, because I'm weird. So we're gonna access it through HTTPS 9443. Why it tried to open HTTP, uh, all right. HTTPS, colon double backslash. Yep, all right. And then we can just create a password. And now we are in Portainer. Go to get started. And you can see it hooked directly into our local Docker instance. We can click on that. And now we have an even fancier GUI to work with. We can go in here and see our stacks. Remember, we created a file browser one and a pie hole one. We can go and see our containers. We can actually exec into them and connect directly up. Oh, this one doesn't use bash, it uses regular shell. And just like that, we are hooked into our, I don't even remember what container I clicked, but we're inside of it. And here you can walk through, see images, networks, volumes, all that fancy stuff. And a cool thing is app templates. They give you a bunch that you can pick from and just install them with one click. Or you can create your own custom templates. And I have my own video all about Portainer, so I'm not gonna go much more into it. If you wanna check that out, uh, feel free to do so. I'll leave a link in the description. But yeah, let's head back into Docker desktop and you can see again, a portainer instance is running in our container tab. And just like that, we have a cool little Docker instance running within Windows. But I do wanna to touch on one more thing and that is the extensions. So you can go ahead and add extensions, which gives you some more little features for your Docker instance. There are a couple that I wanna take a look at. One of them is resource usage, which is pretty useful. I'm gonna go ahead and install that. The other one is volumes backup and share. And once those are done, we'll take a look at them. Let's take a look at resource usage. Now it does exactly what you think. Click on it and you can monitor the resource usage of your entire Docker instance. You can see we're not using much of anything out of 800%, meaning eight cores. Uh, we're using 0.19%. This is why containerization is awesome. Extremely efficient on your hardware. Memory usage, how many containers are running. You can scroll down here and get a breakdown of each of them. Really cool. And taking a look at volumes backup and share. This is another really cool plugin. It's going to list all of our volumes. Obviously we only have one right now. It's really cool because you can export this volume and save it, which is extremely useful for backing it up or moving it to another Docker instance. So if you're using this maybe as a test and you wanna use it, to deploy in production or another test environment, you can simply export the entire volume and use it over there. You can also import, view, clone, empty it. Really useful. And one funny thing I kind of noticed when I was putting this video together is that check out what we have as an extension, Portainer. So you don't even have to go and do it the way that I did. You can simply just click it once and install Portainer. But one thing I did notice is that it doesn't really run Portainer as its own container within Docker. 
I honestly don't know where it's running because if we go uh, back into our containers, you'll see that we still only have one instance of Portainer running. And if we go to the extension Portainer, it just opens up the same uh, GUI, but within the Docker desktop window. So honestly, I would rather go with the normal way because then it can be accessed via, you know, any web browser uh, from any machine on your network. But hey, if, if this is how you want to run it, then go ahead. But that is all I really wanted to cover for using Docker Desktop on Windows. I personally use it on my machine. I do development. I do a lot of testing in Docker. So I'm a big fan of Docker Desktop. It's it's okay to use a GUI sometimes. It, it doesn't make you any less of a nerd, I promise. All right, that was Docker Desktop on Windows. I hope you guys learned something. I hope it was useful for you. Get out there, start messing around with Docker, and maybe one day you'll be a mediocre home lab YouTuber like me. But that is it. I hope you enjoyed it. Drop a like if you did. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I will see you in the next one.